This is Jason Nesmith. He's charismatic, egotistical, overly confident. Whew! Your commander is on deck. Ha <laughs> ha! And this is Sir Alexander Dane. He's hopelessly typecast, jealous, resentful. I played Richard III. Five curtain calls. There were five curtain calls. I was an actor once. Damn it, now look at me. Look at me! Now, typically in a parody film, you would describe a character based on the person they're parodying. Lord Helmet is Darth Vader. I can't breathe in this thing! Topper Harley is Pete Mitchell, aka Maverick. Very pretty, but enough hot dogging, Harley. Just checking the traffic. And Austin Powers is James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Allow myself to introduce myself. But 1999's Galaxy Quest is anything but a standard parody film, and they didn't want to simply rehash existing characters from pop culture. Live long and prosper. They wanted to create something new. Familiar, but simultaneously unique and complex characters that they could build around to create the framework of the story. I mean it. I mean it, Alex. I've never seen him lose it like that. Not to a fan. I mean, it was just weird. Both Bob and I um, had these experiences with these shows, uh, Star Trek being the, the primary one. When I made this, that part was instinctual for me. The, the harder part was telling the story about actors who are has-beens and who want their glory back. How did I come to this? Not again. I played Richard III. That story was the story that was hard to tell. See, in most parody films, the plot of the story follows the same narrative structure as the original film. In Scary Movie, a killer in a mask hunts down a group of high school kids. Do you know where I am? <sighs> in Blazing Saddles, the sheriff has to protect the town from a band of outlaws. And in Airplane, a former military pilot saves a passenger plane after food poisoning takes out the crew. Excuse me. So the first officer is ill, and the captain needs someone to help him with the radio. Do you know anything about planes? I flew in the war, but that was a long time ago. I wouldn't know anything about it. But when creating the screenplay for Galaxy Quest, writer David Howard was adamant that he didn't want to simply construct a parody of an existing Star Trek story, he wanted to create his own. We kept saying as we were making this, it, it can't just be a comedy, it has to be a good Star Trek movie. And this meant that despite the studio simply wanting the characters up in space and getting on with it... He really encouraged us to be our people and not just move the story along. Writer Stephen Koch summarized this best when he said, Your characters are defined by their stories, and your story consists in nothing other than the actions of its characters. Overwritten. Core implosion estimated in eight minutes. In other words, a film shouldn't try to prioritize story over character or vice versa, which is regrettably what happens to most parody films, as they have a tendency to disregard the consistency of the story and the characters involved. Yo. However, on Galaxy Quest, the creators knew they needed to value both equally. No matter how cheesy or goofy the film became, they had to stay true to the story and committed to the characters. To me, uh, it's it's about commitment to a, a very a real grounded character that you believe in, no matter how stupid or ridiculous. Um, and the more committed you are, to me, the funnier it is, because it's more like real life. What difference does it make if it's episode 81 or not? Because I died in episode 81! And to keep the characters grounded, screenwriter David Howard pulled from real interactions he had in Hollywood, and then let the actors use their own experience with these archetypes to give them credibility. Yes, we wish to go to the ship. You see, we work together, or not at all. Oh yeah, yeah, the, those archetypes, the, um, absolutely. I think I've worked with most of them at this point. Alan's character, the kind of pissed off British thespian. Well, you're just gonna have to figure out what it wants. What is its motivation? Sam's character guy definitely worked with that guy. Was, hey, hey, I was in, uh, episode, you know, episode six. I was on the show in 82, episode 81. 
you know, the guy who had the little thing, the little, like, taste of it, and it's just gone through his head. You think I could sit in and uh, sign a couple autographs? The aging sex pot. I mean, my TV Guide interview was six paragraphs about my boobs and how they fit into my suit. What works so well, though, is that the film allows these characters to fit their typecasting and then break out of it by the end of the film. Jason Nesmith finds his empathy. God, I am so sorry. The pretentious Alexander Dane realizes he's positively affecting people. You shall be avenged. And Gwen DeMarco gets to make real decisions that have an actual impact. Fred, get up to command deck, we're separating. And it's for this reason that Galaxy Quest could never work as a direct parody. Because while most find humor in specific and oftentimes forced jokes... When does this happen in the movie? Now. You're looking at now, sir. Everything that happens now is happening now. Galaxy Quest derives its humor from realistic people attempting something with complete conviction and then having it go horribly wrong. I'm attracted to character, uh, and so if you have a terrific character story that happens to be funny, I think that's that sustains itself and and has a um, stands the test of time more than something that's parody or something that's uh, mm -hmm. a joke based um, because you you start to lose the the attachment to it. It's all real. Oh my god! I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! <gasps> And the reason Galaxy Quest needs the audience to be engaged is because it's a unique and original story. It foregoes the tropes of jumping between scenes and subplots and instead focuses on a narrative that progresses in a continuous and linear fashion, mimicking the classic structure of the hero's journey and doing so with complete conviction. Our heroes board the ship, If you would all take your positions, lose their first fight against the antagonist, Perhaps I'm not as stupid as I am ugly, Commander. Grow closer in the wake of their failure. When you and I, we're gonna get to the core and shut it down manually. And then use that bonding to ultimately save the day. <laughs> this means the laughs don't come from obligatory jokes, but rather develop naturally from watching realistic characters grapple with the unrealistic situation they find themselves in. It's just taking it seriously, and you're not in a comedy, you're in something deadly serious. These people are fighting for their lives. They're frustrated actors. It's not about gags, it's just about recognizing a human situation. Take this scene with the beryllium sphere. The original script had the crew landing, and then immediately cutting to them searching the planet. But Tim Allen brought up that in a science fiction film, they would test the air beforehand. You just can't land the stupid ship on the planet. Somebody's got a tricorder or some thing. We got to test the oxygen level. And it naturally led to one of the best lines in the film. And so we did that whole scene with with Rockwell. He took that line. He goes, you can't just open the door. Somebody's got to test the air. Hey, don't open that. It's an alien planet. Is there air? You don't know. That same attention to detail can be found in another late addition to the script, the infamous chomper scene. Chompers? They're a device that would be featured in an episode solely to build tension in the scene, but serve no logistical function on the ship. It makes no logical sense! Why is it here? But because the Thermines assume everything on the show, no matter how implausible, is real, it leads to the joke and one of the greatest dubs in cinematic history. On the surface, Galaxy Quest might appear to be another pop culture parody, but unlike many of those films that prioritize laughs over depth, Galaxy Quest invests in its characters, giving them layers and complexity. Mathazar, I think your people have a great commander. Each character undergoes a journey of self-discovery, grappling with personal insecurities and evolving throughout the story. It's a celebration of humanity, an exploration of human relationships and emotions, and it's this depth and level of passion that allows a super cheesy and implausible ending to hit such a strong emotional beat. I'm Luke Custer. <laughs> I just had this really interesting idea. And I leave you with one of my favorite line deliveries in cinematic history. Oh, that's not right. No.
Thank you.